Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Art to Heart. Today I'm here with artist Betty Collier and we're discussing her solo show Wonders of Nature. And Betty is inspired by the universal embodiment of nature as well as the human figure. So tell us a bit about what's going on and what you're exhibiting this time around. Well, to start with, if you want to see more of my work, go to www.bettycollier.com all one word, B double T Y C O double L I E R. Now, this is a small portion of the work that I've done. I started uh, studying when I was 16 or 17 in art to be a teacher, wow. an art teacher at secondary school. Then I did more study when I was in my 30s. Uh, that time I had a husband, two small children under five and I had to fit in study, teaching part-time and looking after two children. So it was a little bit of a battle. Um, with my drawings and my paintings, they've come later in life after I've retired. And I retired at 62 and a half from teaching in uh, a university, which I'd been there for 30 years. Now, I started to save and decide to go on safaris and as you might notice, I've got arthritis, which wasn't always easy to do a safari or go on trips. Yeah. But I decided if I didn't do it, I wouldn't have that wonderful experience of seeing what's out there. So that's one of the reasons I keep pushing myself and doing what I'm doing. Now, one of the places I went to that was very, very special was Galapagos. And I was after someone to go with me. Everybody said, no, we don't want to go there. And I thought, no, this is a very, very special place. And if I don't go there, some of those animals and birds will become in dangers, mm. endangered and extinct. So I went to Galapagos and I was the only Australian on the group which doesn't make things easy when you're in your late 60s, 70s. And the animals and the birds have individual islands where you can see individual. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're not on the one island. Oh, wow. And some of them are becoming extinct and they've got to be very careful. So one of the islands I went on to had the Galapagos, uh, had the iguana. Now, the iguana is, I suppose, like a prehistoric lizard but he's quite um, friendly in the sense that he's not going to run away from you he's not mm. going to hurt you and to me looking at his face I could almost see a smile on it so that's why you've got the iguana itself now if you notice I've used very fine ink pens to try and highlight like that um, density at the lower part of the iguana and get the rounded curve of the body. So the uh, definition gives that feeling of having a body in the iguana. So it's just not flat. Yeah. Um, that was one of the ones I did from iguana, the uh, Galapagos one, the iguana. Another one I did, which is over there, was the tortoise. Now, that was a very, very special one because if we don't watch out, they're going to be extinct. Mm -hmm. um, what happens there, they had to have a special island for them. They had to make sure it was rat free uh, because the rats eat the eggs and they take so long to breed that it's getting to the stage where there's not many left. So he, once again, was something I tried to get that feeling of the shell over the top with the ink and the very fine lines. The ink itself, uh, you buy in special pens at any art display shop mm -hmm. and news agents. So it's not something that people can't get. They can very easily get the, the pens and use them and use good watercolour paper or cotton rag. From there, I went to South Africa and this is one of the other ones there, the elephants, and went on safari. So I was in an open jeep with a guard and um, a driver and five other Australians. And 
it was a very special time once again. You'd need the open Jeep to get the feel of uh, the jungle or the bush, more like um, savannah type land, uh, to get the, the feel of what's going on. So these elephants here, they were on a little river and the two older ones, I presume were mum and dad, were trying to get the little baby one to learn to roll over. And it was in the mud and they're there prodding it with their, their um, great big foot. Finally got it to do that, then they all got up and they walked away. So that's why you've got the, the family there and the little one had his leg sort of sitting out like that and his... Um, and I thought, oh, that looks good. So I captured that. And from there, I did... From there, also in South, I had the ostrich. So here are two looks of the ostrich in watercolour and ink. Uh, that was also a special time. I was given the opportunity to sit on the ostrich. Oh my! <laughs> now I thought will I or won't I and I thought I'll never get this experience again. So I hopped on a, a platform, <laughs> hopped on the ostrich but I wasn't game enough to go down the road. <laughs> Um, some people rode it like a horse, oh but it is so wide, um, I thought, no, I might fall off. At my age, that's not very dignified, <laughs> and I might end up with some broken bones. So that's what I've tried to give there, the, the curiosity of the ostrich wow. and how they dash around and look at you. So if you look at the eyes and the beak, they're the most important things but that head has that ducking <laughs> quality. So also cool. in South Africa, we did travelling on a bus. And one of the things we saw was the Cape Town and the bird in red, with the red oh. breast. And in that one, I've tried to use complementary colours so that the red of the bird in watercolour can project forward with the flowers and the breast and the landscape go backwards so that you've got your your greens and your reds to play backwards and forwards. And what would you say has been one of the lessons that these experiences have brought upon for you, not just for your art but in general? Well it's been important, it's, it's opened another life mm -hmm. for me, another challenge, another world, hasn't it? Because we live in cities, we don't realise that so many things are, are being endangered mm. and we don't realise what's out there and we don't realise what we can do if we really want to. And that's what it's about too, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you can sit down and not do anything or you can keep pushing yourself. That's powerful and it's, it's so inspiring how you are the difference just by going out there and making those choices whether you had support or not in your journey. So what advice would you give anyone that has that pull and is a bit hesitant to know what they can do to support these endangered species? Well, I'm not a rich person. In Australia, I get a, an old age pension and I don't have to pay tax. So that tells you that I'm not rich at all. Uh, I just haven't got the money, but I've got the desire mm -hmm. and I've got the drive. And it doesn't matter what age you are, you've got to have drive if you want to keep on going. Mm -hmm. um, and you learn all the time, you never stop. So I hope to do more, or have more challenges, get better at my art. Now I did a, a series on mushrooms and not just two dimensional, I did those three dimensional so that they're also in alabaster. And I, I wanted to suggest that almost feeling of movement in these, these are pastel, mm. so that I can use the pastel to give that feeling of weight underneath it, but also because of the stems themselves, a feeling of lightness. So you've got a contradictory quality about it. And they can look organic or they can look whatever you think. So they could also be out of uh, another world or something like that. I also 
did a little bit of underwater swimming because once in my younger day I used to be not a bad swimmer. So I went up to Queensland in Australia where you have the Great Barrier Reef. Now that in itself is a wonderful experience because you put on a, a wetsuit and you get in the water and you swim around where the fish are. So you can almost touch all these brightly coloured fish as they go in the reef. So that's where my fish influences come from, swimming in the Great Barrier Reef. You have some right here, right? Yes. Yeah. Here's another one. And this one here, uh, you could perhaps say I cheated a bit there. I went to <laughs> a, a factory and there's a factory down in Tasmania where they actually have it like a baby factory where you, they have small uh, dragon ones and they sell them to the rest of the world. Wow, I didn't know that. Yes, it's so it's, it's really a production line. But the fact that they do that because they're becoming less and less in the water and they're only small. You don't realise that they're only a, a couple of inches big. I think in the stories we used to read as children, sometimes they yeah. <laughs> were as big as we were. <laughs> so that was another thing that was an inspiration. And they look like plant forms as they're floating around. So beautiful. There's a little tale about the butterfly. That's in watercolour. But I've got, and she's now 13, a 13 year old granddaughter. Now, she used to come and stay with me every Friday night from when she was about, oh, 10, 11 months old. And she used to stay Friday nights and I used to mind her. Now she became interested in butterflies and snails and things of that nature because I'd take her for a walk in a pusher and we'd talk about it all. <laughs> and this is where the butterflies came. Oh. So I did some drawings of some butterflies um, and gave her some and gave did two for myself in the watercolour to, to try and get the make it happy because butterflies are pleasant and beautiful and fly around and that they're is, part of fairy so tale. They really are, they're magical. Creatures. Yes, that's so, so that's where the butterflies come from. And I did a series on chooks or hens and roosters because most people in my day, we used to have a hen house <laughs> and we used to have the roosters plus all the chickens at home. And we used to breed eggs and eat the eggs, or breed the chickens and eat the eggs and all that sort of thing. So that was part of my childhood. And one of my friends has got um, a bantam rooster, and that's this one here. <laughs> Unfortunately, there was four of them, but now there's only one. Oh my. We ha also have foxes in Australia and they didn't realise that if you left them roaming around, they were new out to the countryside, they didn't last very long. So they had to put the poor old rooster in a, a hen house or a house mm. so that it couldn't roam around. So he's got a bit fat. <laughs> <laughs> he's not getting the exercise <laughs> that he should have. But to me also, the roosters took on personalities. If you've ever had anything to do with a rooster, you'll know that it's got a mind of its own and it likes to dominate. Yes, they do. And <laughs> that's why they've got names underneath them to go with the personalities that I've given the rooster. And to me, they're strong. They're very strong. And as a child, I'd feed the, the hens and have to walk back backwards because the roosters used to peck me <laughs> on the back of the leg. Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> They're powerful as little So, uh, put it this way, we have a um, healthy relationship <laughs> with each other. Uh. And I just don't go wandering in and thinking they won't do anything. <laughs> But they're That's also a very majestic story. animal or birds, aren't they? Yeah. They do have a, quite a majestic quality about them. They're so natural leaders. They, they are, the and they like to rule the roost. Yes. Another episode of my life was when I went to Turkey. And I've got a series here that show the drawings from Turkey. So I've done warriors, I've done ordinary people, and I've done ones that have had learning. 
because they were a great nation, the Romans, when, and when they conquered or went through Turkey, they've added so much more to their history and perhaps a little bit more to their cultural uh, aspects architecturally and what they've done there because they're a very knowledgeable culture. Tell us a bit about that. Most of my ideas actually came from museums because I'd wander around there and see these statues uh, that had come from the Romans and looked at the individuality in some of the carvings and they showed a very proud history there and a very, um, in their time, knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. So that the other thing that struck me was that if you were a warrior, you wouldn't have had a name. In, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have been known well in society. You would just be a warrior. Wow. And if you died, nobody would have worried. But they're also the privileged. And the privileged ones, they had a, a better life. They had servants. They had what they wanted. So you, you looked at the different class hierarchy. That's an interesting perspective. And that's what I've done. Now if you look at the technique, it's been done on what you'd call cotton rag, mm -hmm. which is thicker. It also has got a, a textural quality a little bit like uh, the old blotting paper. I don't know whether you know what that is, but we used to have ink out of a, an inkwell and use a pen and then you'd blot it with this blotting paper. And that's some of the quality that you would find in that cotton rag. Ah, okay. It's quite a thick one, but when you're using it with the pen, it tends to uh, clog up your pen. So you have to spend a lot of time wiping the end of the pen. But it's a mixture of ink, it's a mixture of watercolour pencil, and it's also watercolour pencil without water because the watercolour pencil without the water is a lot softer to use. And so the paper itself has got quite a texture on it. Yeah, I see that. So that was meant to bring out that quality of being older and mm -hmm. having an age to it. And little, not a lot of colour, more your light and your dark values, because it comes from another period. Mm -hmm. I didn't want colour to be a, an abstraction. Yeah. I want it to be that light and dark focus to try and get a little bit more form and light wow. coming in in places that I could pick out. There's so much thought into your creative <laughs> process, I love it. It's so that's the reason for the uh, Etruscan or the echoes from the past in Turkey. And probably the last one here that I've... I've done a series on frogs. Now I've done those in ink, I've done them in watercolour, and I've also done them in wax, and, and they've been made into bronze. Mm. So that once again, they've had their own personalities, but there's a story behind that too. Because as a child, we lived on the outskirts of Ballarat, which is about 120 miles from Melbourne. And I was allowed to roam around pretty much as I liked. And there used to be uh, waterways, uh, ponds, as we used to call them, and I used to collect tadpoles. And my mother very kindly lent me her pie dish to put the tadpoles in. And oh I used to watch them grow up, slowly lose their tail and grow legs. Mm -hmm. And that used to fascinate me as a young child. Now, as I've got older, the frogs have become less and less. So it's something that I've noticed quite dramatically. Mm. We haven't got the environment to sustain the frogs we had to. So that's why I've done a series on the frogs. But to me, they've also got a lively personality too. Yes, they do. And my bronze ones, which are on my web page, they've got, they've got names because we've had a few, oh well, one politician who didn't quite do as he should have done and he's called Barnaby, I'm not perfect. <laughs> and there's been a few other ones like Gollum and Igor um, <laughs> that have taken on story characters. Yes. And that's a, a different technique altogether. So you've got something heavy, solid, and you can hold on to. Yeah. 
the the owl series is probably the last one that I've been working on and we do have an owl sanctuary near my home but unfortunately ordinary people can't go to it and this what I'm working on is going to send one of my drawings to the owner and see whether I'm allowed to come and visit oh, that's what I'm hoping for okay. so that I'll be able to go and see all the owls now I've done owls from all over the world because I didn't realise there were so many different types of owls, so many sizes, and some of them, like this little owl here, starting to become endangered. Mm -hmm. It's one that lives up in North India, and in another 50 years we pro probably won't have that one at all. And many of the other ones are in that predicament, that if we don't look after them, we just won't have them. Once again, I've used the fine pens on watercolour paper and I've tried to emphasise the eyes because I think that's what we look at mm -hmm. when we look at an owl and, and how they can sort of stare at you everywhere. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I would like to know what's your experience You've told me a little bit about your creative process, so what's your experience when you're done, when you feel like you've arrived to the final result of your work each time? Sometimes I think to myself, I wish you could do better, <laughs> and that's often a, a consideration. And then I think, well, I want to keep on pushing forward and learn a bit more so I will get better. It's not something that's static. It's mm -hmm. something that's going to go on until um, visually and figuratively or with my hands and my legs and everything else, I can't go roaming around and I can't go and do it. Yeah. So I hope the end is a long way off. Yes. Yeah. And I hope I keep developing. And I hope to be able to keep on doing sculpture because some of my sculpture I couldn't bring over because it's too expensive to bring over. But I do carve in things like alabaster, which is quite hard to carve, and I carve in what we call Pilbara jade, which is probably technically serpentine, and I've had to get angle grinders, um, tools that have got diamond tips. Wow. And physically on my body, that is quite difficult, quite hard, yeah. but I think that is really what I want to do. And there's no one around my area that does that sort of work. Wow, that's interesting. I've also done oxy welding, which is another thing that a lot of um, people of my age, because I'll be 77 next month, have never had the chance or wanted to do. Oh, okay. And on my web page, I've got a, a couple of oxy welded screens showing areas of nature, whether they're mushrooms or flowers. Um, I did have a great big sea one, but a lady that did um, or studied different sea facets, she has that in her house. Ah, it's beautiful. You're so inspiring. Your, your process of learning and continuing is, is really inspiring. And um, I think you shared so much with us to take with, back with us in our own creative process. and. I think our audience would like to know what is coming forward, what can they expect of you in this following year, where can they find you other than your website, if there's anything you want to share that you're working on right now? I'm not, but I have some thoughts. I'm going on a, a small fortnightly trip through America okay, cool. in the southwest, I think it's called, or midwest. So I'm hoping to find some cool. inspiration there. And when I go home, I've got a, a, a Pilbara jade one to finish car. I've carved it, I've got to sand it. Oh my. And that's going to, I've got perhaps a fortnight's hard sanding to put it in an exhibition in Melbourne. This is exciting. Well, I look forward to seeing it. I hope you send us some images and we look forward yes. to sharing that with you. So. Thank you for joining us with Betty Collier once again and stay inspired as she does. Goodbye. <laughs>